Hello, I'm Safin and I'll be going over how to approach critical services in this two-part video as part of the Linux Visually series. In the first half of the video, we'll be talking about init systems and how they, manages, how, how they manage services on Linux. We'll also go over how they relate to processes, so if you haven't watched my previous video on ports and processes, I highly encourage you to pause the video and do just that. Alright, let's get started. In the last video, we talked about how the ports and processes infrastructure on Linux is very similar to a factory. The operating system provisions resources for processes to run executable files. These files may bind, or these processes rather, may bind to ports to communicate with other devices over the network. As we know, running a binary from the command line creates a corresponding process for this. And I'd encourage you to pause the video and test just this out. You can actually open two separate terminal windows, run dash, which is an interactive shell in one of them, and run the ps aux command to grep for dash, and you'll see the dash uh, process that's running currently on your system. So you could actually replicate this uh, on your system. However, this is actually not the only way to start a process by typing in the command line. They can actually run in the background, meaning without us having to manually start it. Uh, that would be through the command line. Um, however, services on Linux actually perform this whole background execution function, and they provide a standardized way to control background processes and even automatically start them on system boot. Most Debian-based Linux distributions you'll be competing on come with systemd pre-installed. Systemd is an implementation of a Linux construct called an init system. The init system is the first process that starts when the Linux kernel has been loaded or started up, essentially when your system boots. You can think of it as a large control panel with switches to start, stop, and automate services. As shown in the diagram, these services correspond to processes running in the background um, without us explicitly running the binary corresponding to it. For example, there's some services controlling our network connection, um, there's one controlling a desktop session, which is GDM3, and long-running software such as SSH servers. So this large control panel can actually manage um, these three services by switching them on and off without having to interactively run them in a terminal. They'll be running in the background. To configure each of these services, systemd uses unit configuration files. These are sort of like the individual switches on our physical control panel. They can modify independent background processes running on the system. And there's a bunch of different types of these systemd units that can launch processes based on triggers. Um, this could be just the system booting up, but the triggers can be a little bit more complicated, such as a file system mount or a network activity, um, such as a packet being received over the network. However, we're mostly going to be concerned about service units, which are sort of the most basic units and can be used to manipulate services. Service units uh, define the behavior of background processes, including their start, stop, and restart procedures, along with certain dependencies, meaning other services that might need to start in order for this particular service to start. For example, a file server service um, unit would contain instructions for launching the file server software at boot and restarting it if it crashes, allowing for precise control and automation within the system. If you're curious about the many other types of systemd units, I'd highly encourage you to click on the link or click on the link to this presentation in the description of this video to check out the link I put on this slide. Um, and yeah, the, the pres this presentation will be found in, in the description, but this particular link you'll have to click on the presentation slide. Uh, let's actually dive into the unit configuration file. Start by getting your clean Ubuntu virtual machine open and navigating to the user lib systemd system directory. I'm actually going to head over there right now and essentially perform what I'm doing here on the slide. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is launch a single terminal. And here I'll navigate to that directory. So this would be lib, or first actually I'll elevate to root, just in case I need this as a root terminal later. I'm going to cd actually to user, oops, user lib system d system and run the ls command in here and then i'll open a second terminal second terminal and run the oh i'll rather i'll first elevate to sudo or elevate to root using sudo and i'll will run a different command whoops i'll run a different command in this terminal and i'll get to that in just a second but 
try to replicate this, uh, what I have right there, open up to this directory and have another terminal open ready to go. And we're actually going to be running the systemctl list units dash dash type equals service command. So systemctl list units dash dash type equals service. And you should see, should see these two different screens. Now, running the ls command in the user lib systemd system directory should show you all loaded systemd units on your system. To check the current status of these units, we could actually go back to the output that we just created here using the uh, command that we just ran, which was systemctl list units dash dash type equals service. And this will sort of display whether a service is loaded, meaning the systemd init system understands that um, the service has been sort of configured and is ready to go to be uh, run or, or whatever the user has configured it uh, to do. So basically, if you if you scroll up in here, I'll actually ls star service and pipe this into a pager, and you'll actually see one for one every single service in this a directory is also uh, in that list units command, and all of them are loaded. The reason being that they're in this directory in the first place. Um, so yeah, and uh, it'll also display some additional information, uh, including whether the service is active. Um, which is sort of a high-level state describing whether the service is act, uh, like actually running or has ran as opposed to being completely inactive, uh, which means that it hasn't started at all. So you might be able to find some down here, um, but these are all active for, in particular. Um, but we can also see some other information here. Oh, this one's failed. Um, but we can also see this sub uh, column, which is sort of more of a low-level description of the service status. So a service might be active, but um, it could have exited already, meaning that it, um, it, it, ran a, it executed a certain background process and that process finished and it successfully uh, finished uh, completely. And it could also be running, meaning it is still in progress executing some sort of background process that is still actually running. Um, you can also manipulate a service's like active state using the systemctl start, stop, and restart commands, which should be like somewhat self-explanatory. Um, so, for example, let's see, let's pick one that isn't extremely uh, extremely critical for system function. Uh, let's pick ssh.service. We'll just do systemctl uh, stop ssh, and if we run systemctl status ssh we can see that the service is stopped, meaning inactive right here. So we see this active and it says inactive. We can also restart SSH and we'll see that it's running now. So that sort of uh, displays whether a particular service, meaning the background process associated with it, is actually running. Um, note that for most applications, uh, you'll need to restart the corresponding service if you've changed certain configurations for it. So for example, if you changed a, a configuration in an Etsy SSH, SSHD config, uh, and hit enter, and you change something in this file, you would have to run the systemctl restart SSH command in order for those changes to take effect. Um, this is just something very important to keep in mind when hardening a certain program through its preferences. Um, so just just be aware, be mindful of that. Let's actually take a closer look at the output of that sysctl status command. And here I've just popped up a systemctl status network manager. If you run that command, you should get the exact same output right here. We'll see some output from the executable um, being run uh, down here. And we'll also see the process ID associated with it. Um, and, and also the name of the process and a few other things, such as the amount of resources being used. However, there's a, a few more important parts that we that we sort of want to look in. Uh, so the enabled and uh, vendor preset um, part of the output right here is sort of describing whether uh, the service is enabled or not, meaning that when a service, so when a service is enabled, it means that it will automatically start um, on, at boot time. So network manager, meaning the program that controls whether our computer is connected to a network, should start out boot time, which is expected behavior, obviously, because uh, our computer should connect to the network when we turn it on. Um, but it, you can also disable a service um, and, and manipulate its, its service state. Um, and we'll go over those states real quick. So 
essentially what we have here is, well, first of all, we just discussed what enabled means, but disabled means that a service will not start on boot automatically. And there's a third state, which is sort of like a an, ex, an extra addition on top of disabled, meaning that the um, it, it's called masked, and it means that a service will not start on boot whatsoever, even if other services depend on it to start. So uh, this is not necessarily a state that you may actually set a service to during a cybersecurity competition, for example, as it's really overkill for disabling a service, but it is not unheard of to see services pre-masked in a compromised environment. Um, so I encourage you to baseline service statuses um, and, and on, 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 sorry, on uncompromised and scenario machines to determine if any critical service has actually been maliciously masked. Um, and you can actually manipulate the status of a program by running the systemctl, and then uh, this would be enable SSH, for example, and it'll successfully run that command, and we'll see status, we'll see that it is enabled right here. You could disable it so that it does not start on boot. So that'd be like this. Um, disabled. Uh, note that in this case, is, in this case, it's still actually active because disabled means that on the next reboot, it will not start automatically. So this would be red if we reboot it. But for now, it is still running. And you could also mask it for it to be completely disabled, even if it's required by a different service. So let's talk a little bit what, more about what this whole requirement stuff means. And uh, to do that, we're going to actually take a closer look at the network manager service file, which is located in the libsystemd system directory. And you can actually open it up just along with me, um, and we'll go over the different parts of it. So let's just take a look at the unit file in its entirety. So as always, I've obscured out the commented lines, but I encourage you to check out uh, on your virtual machine as well. Um, like check this out on your virtual machine if you if you like to actually understand what it does. Um, so under the unit header, which is this top part right here, um, we'll see some basic information on what the service is, like a description, um, some documentation, um, and a few other uh, dependencies or dependent services, um, and when it will be loaded relative to them. So um, network manager might want this particular unit to be loaded uh, before it actually enables itself um, during the boot process. So really all it does is uh, define the order uh, relative to other units that this particular service will be started. Not something that's extremely important for you to worry about, but is something cool to know about. Um, at the bottom, we'll see some similar uh, preferences right here, wanted by, uh, also, also. They're similar to the top preferences, uh, but they're, they're different in that um, their preferences to be sort of run when a service is enabled or disabled. So that's what it means by install. So if you disable the program or enable the program, it would ensure that uh, it is it is uh, it done relative to these other different services uh, that are running. Um, but yeah, like I said, you can sort of look into those on your own if you'd like. I've actually linked uh, the man page for systemd.unit if you want to look at it, and you can run this command in your terminal as well. But really, I want to focus on the um, service sort of section of this of this file. Um, and I've just zoomed it in for us so we can take a closer look at it. Um, we'll see many configurations that begin with the word exec, and these are the actual programs, so binary executables, that will start as a background process along with their respective command line arguments, as you can see here, such as no daemon or any of this other stuff. Um, and, and it actually notes that it's possible for an attacker to modify potential flags, uh, program flags, to manipulate behavior. So if there was a certain flag for a uh, server that we were running in a systemd service, it is possible that somebody could uh, alter these flags and do something such as enable debug mode, which would add additional error information for an attacker to uh, use um, to their advantage. So I would always take a look at these exec lines to be um, sure that they haven't been tampered with. Um, in another security related configuration, uh, are these uh, capability configurations. So you'll see the capability bounding set in the service file. I've just added a ambi ambient capabilities here as well, just to make sure that you know that it exists. Um, while I'm not exactly going to go over what the capabilities uh, or capabilities are, I've, I've linked a in brief introduction to them right here if you want to take a look, as well as um, a man page containing all the reference for every single preference in, in systemd uh, service configuration files. Sort of the gist of um, capabilities is that uh, it allows you to arbitrarily assign root-like permissions to an unprivileged process. 
This could be something like administratively altering the states of network interfaces, which are obviously hardware and require administrative access to, to uh, modify. Uh, for example, to connect to Wi-Fi, which is something a normal user might want to do. This capability bounding set preference essentially limits the capabilities of a privileged process that might be running as the root user, while ambient capabilities, which is this preference that I have commented out right here and isn't configured for the network manager service, allows you to actually assign arbitrary um, capabilities to a service entirely at your, your own will. Overall, I would just ensure that you look over these service files in their entirety to ensure that they haven't been tampered with capability-wise. Finally, the user and group preferences dictate what user and group the processes spawned by system, the systemd service have. Essentially, all of the binary executables that get run through these exec commands that we see down here are actually um, sort of tied to a user and group, um, meaning that they run with that certain user's permissions. If the user and group are set to root, for example, this means that any code running uh, as the service or under the service, meaning any ex binary executable uh, running under the service, it has free will to tamper with the system as the root user, which means it could basically do anything to obliterate your system because it has full capability to do so. Now, you might be wondering why that's an issue if, a, if, if you're running a program intentionally, like a, a software that you installed, uh, like a web server maybe to host a website. And this is just important to be mindful of. There's actually uh, a, this is a, like a problem because attackers who potentially gain access to a remote code execution vulnerability, and I would highly encourage you to Google that and maybe see what that is. But basically the idea is that a broken website could execute commands uh, on the actual system that's hosting it. And if the server um, software is actually running as the root user, it's basically game over if you're defending the server. So those are the important points I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at. Again, the exec um, parameters right here, capabilities, and the user and group. There's a, a huge amount of, of more uh, preferences to look at, but just ensure that those haven't been tampered with, especially in a uh, in the context of a cybersecurity competition where they're often messed with to create persistent vulnerabilities that red teamers or attackers can access over and over again. So be very careful about these um, unit configuration files. Now, I'm going to leave you with some sort of final thoughts in this video to summarize what we've talked about. I know this is a more of a brief video, but I want to just summarize again like uh, what we what we mentioned here. Services are essentially a way to spawn and manage a process that runs in the background of your system. And um, these services have um, processes within them and um, they can automatically services will automatically spawn these processes uh, to run in the background. And these individual processes will actually run a single executable binary and also provision resources, hardware resources for them, including like RAM and CPU. Um, and it also, uh, you can also, it's, it's important to note that um, a service could possibly spawn multiple processes. Now, each of these would be running individual executables. They could be running the same executable um, in the case of multi-process uh, programs. Um, and uh, these would be considered sub-processes. So just uh, remember that that could happen um, yeah, so, um, and, and note that those sub processes would be actually under, uh, these original, like, processes that the service spawns. Um, overall, the, like, strategy-wise, I think it's a good idea to monitor Active System D services, um, using the sysctls we talked about earlier, so starting, stopping, enabling, disabling, and even masking them at times, or unmasking, um, Active uh, System D services with the sysctl command. Um, and sort of, I've linked, uh, my, my final suggestions again, are to just baseline your um, system D service configurations and unit configurations, especially for important critical services uh, like software that, um, that you, you've intended to install for company purposes. Uh, I've actually linked a former teammate's blog post right here. Uh, if you go to the slideshow, you'll be able to click on it with some details on baselining methodology as well as great cybersecurity competition advice. So I'd highly encourage you to check that out. 
And yeah, stay tuned for the next video where we'll discuss exactly how to approach critical services. No, not systemd services, but software stacks, uh, different terminology, don't get confused, and locking them down. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for watching. And of course, let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. So yeah.